Energy should be free. And by energy, I mean the energy we use to heat our house, cook our food, and power our cars. Technically, energy is free already, isn't it? All you need is somewhere to capture it, like a solar panel, or a windmill, or a water turbine. But then you need somewhere to store it because when you capture it, might not be when you want to use it. But technically, that's already free as well. You could use unwanted car batteries, a large body of water, like a lake or a water tank, or even a large thermal mass to store heat. Now, when I say energy should be free, I don't necessarily mean for everyone, but for those who really need it. Those who are struggling right now, by not being able to afford to pay for energy to meet their basic living needs. For many people, they can afford to pay for energy. It's not a big part of their budget. But for some people, it's not like that. Some people can't afford to pay for energy to heat their house, cook safely, or provide light after dark. For these people, not being able to afford to pay for energy will affect their opportunities in life. For these people, energy being free would change their lives. So why, when we already have options for free energy, do we still have people experiencing energy hardship, where they're unable to pay for energy to meet their basic living needs? This seems a little bit odd, a little bit counterintuitive. I believe we can make energy free for those who really need it and use this to reduce energy hardship. And there's three key things that we need to do to make this happen. First, we need to involve those very people who would benefit the most from free energy when coming up with energy solutions. We need their perspective. Second, we need to look at this problem from both a social and a technical perspective. And third, we could open source the free energy solutions that work so people around the world could benefit. So I'll talk about each of those ideas, but first I want to explain what motivates me to talk about this topic. So I work with teams of electrical engineers at the local power lines company, Unison. And while Unison is a very forward-thinking company, these ideas I'm talking about are not necessarily the views of Unison. <laughs> But I do feel very privileged to have been part of some very robust discussions with some very smart people, both at my company and others, about what the energy systems of the future will look like. And more importantly, what our society needs from that wider energy landscape. Now it's clear to many people that we're on the cusp of some major changes in the way we generate, store, and use energy. What got me interested in working in the electricity industry were the exciting new technologies Things like electric vehicles, solar panels, and hydrogen fuel cells. These things really interest me, and these are the things that I felt would change the world for the better. But what I've come to realize is that these aren't the really important energy problems that we need to solve. The really important problem we need to solve is energy hardship. Energy hardship is where a house or family can't afford to um, heat their home to make it healthy and safe. And in some more extreme cases, it prevents people providing light after dark or cooking safely. And energy hardship is particularly concerning as it leads to health issues. Things like increased asthma rates for children and increased winter deaths for the elderly. In New Zealand, over 100,000 households can't afford to adequately heat their homes. And that's according to the electricity pricing review conducted by the New Zealand government last year. Worryingly, children live in many of these homes. The result is unhealthy living conditions that disproportionately affect children. This will affect these children's health, 
their education and their employment opportunities in life. According to the International Energy Agency, over a billion people don't have access to any electricity, and many who do can't afford to use it. They also estimate around 3 million people die prematurely every year from smoky environments caused by cooking with solid fuels like wood and coal, and women and children suffer the worst effects of that. And this is despite new energy technologies emerging every year, and some existing ones like solar panels and batteries having significantly decreased in cost over the last decade. So where is the disconnect? Why can't we as a society harness these technological improvements to solve energy hardship? And the irony of the situation is that some of the exciting new technologies actually end up making electricity cheaper for the rich and more expensive for the poor. And this is because most of the costs associated with supplying electricity are fixed and don't change based on how much electricity you use. The network and infrastructure required to bring electricity to your home doesn't change based on how much you use. And therefore, those who can afford to install solar panels can reduce their contribution to those fixed network costs, leaving it for those who can't afford solar panels to pay for. I believe the underlying reason why these promising new technologies aren't helping to address energy hardship simply comes down to perspective. We all have our own worldview, our way of looking at the world, our values and beliefs. And that's why I think the first thing we need to do to tackle energy hardship is to involve those people who would benefit the most from free energy when we're coming up with energy solutions. There's a saying that you need to walk a mile in someone's shoes to really understand what they're going through. And I believe that applies to this problem of energy hardship. If we're going to make energy free for those who really need it, we need the perspective of those who need it most. But I'd also argue it's a little bit more than that. We need to take a wider view of the problem. We need to look at it from both the social and the technical perspective. So if we look at energy hardship as a socio-technical system, we can see on the one hand we've got the promising new technologies, and on the other, the needs and perspectives that people bring to the problem. There's this potential synergy between the technology and people's needs, but only if we can combine those technical capabilities with the, the needs and perspectives of people who understand and have experienced energy hardship. And this is because our perspective is laden with assumptions, many of which we're completely unaware of. And that makes it hard for us to understand how people different to us live their lives and what's important to them. If we have people coming up with energy solutions whose values and assumptions are different to those experiencing energy hardship, then those energy solutions aren't going to solve that problem. For example, in New Zealand, we know that many of the families experiencing energy hardship are Maori and Pacifica families. So these are the cultural values that will matter if we're going to address energy hardship. We also know that many of the homes where there is energy hardship include um, a solo mother bringing up a family. So it's her perspective that will matter if we want solutions that will work. So to tackle this problem of energy hardship, we need the engineers and the business leaders. But we also need these other views. And when you get people working together from different backgrounds, something very interesting happens. They don't just bring a better understanding of what people really need. Groups that are diverse are actually much better at solving complex problems. They're better at coming up with a wider range of ideas, sort of thinking outside the box. I've seen in my own research, well, I've seen firsthand how teams that are diverse really are better at solving real-world problems. The team that I was looking at were using technology to um, innovate and, and solve complex problems, and where there was diversity in the teams, they were better able to come up with a wider range of ideas, sift out the bad ones, as well as having a better understanding of what outcomes were needed to be successful. And that brings me to my third point. If we're going to help people experiencing energy hardship on a larger scale, globally, 
We need to open source the free energy solutions that work. So open sourcing is about making knowledge freely available to people to, to use and enhance. And the idea originally comes from the software development industry, but it's been used really effectively in other domains, things like sharing, creating clothing patterns to share so they can be used for free, and creating designs for people to use for 3D printing, but for free. So if we're going to solve this problem on this larger scale, we need a way of um, freely sharing knowledge about these free energy solutions. We need a way of connecting up some of the great energy projects that are happening in communities around the world, but in isolated pockets. So for example, here in Hawke's Bay, there's a, um, a great project to build a solar farm to power 400 low-income households. Power to the People is a charitable organisation which is building the solar farm in Flaxmere. The solar panels still have to pay their own way, but it's about giving the profits back to the people in the form of cheaper power. The group says it's really about tackling health issues, which flows on to school attendance and employment opportunities. The local community worker says there's many examples of families that are unable to pay their bills, and these solar panels could be part of the solution, depending on the cost. And looking a bit further afield, another great energy project is the Blue Skin Energy Network. And this is a solar sharing venture set up by a community in the southern part of New Zealand. And this works um, in collaboration with a peer-to-peer -peer trading platform from a company called EMH Trade that allows people to buy and sell power from each other. So in this project, 60 households have joined together and they can sell solar power, solar power they generate to others in their community. In the same way, they might sell produce to others in the community. And looking further afield, this time globally, another great example of a community energy project is in Bangladesh. So in Bangladesh, I think there's around 29 million households and about 17 million can't connect to the electricity grid. So the company SolShare set up this solar sharing platform so houses with a solar panel on their roof can sell to others in their microgrid. And this has created a new business model that um, covers areas where there's mobile coverage, but no electricity net network. And it works by providing low cost energy services to the poor, but at the same time is improving the energy services that they experience. So these community projects are great, but they're not the whole solution. Each project works well for the community within which it operates, but it doesn't help those experiencing hardship in other communities. If we are going to help those um, experiencing hardship in other communities on that larger scale, we need a way of capturing what works, sharing it, and then enhancing it. We need a way of organising the energy future. It's like a self-learning system that bakes in this collaboration and learning. And this sort of approach has been called a, a cybernetic system. So a cybernetic system is one that uses feedback to continuously improve. So using this approach, we could continually improve the free energy solutions from feedback so we, the overall energy model becomes more effective. Um, and every now and again, there's breakthrough ideas or a new technology emerges on the energy landscape. And that allows a step change in the energy, energy solutions, which allows a new energy model to emerge, which is then continuously improved until the next big breakthrough occurs. And finally, a cybernetic energy system would need a central hub, a centralised knowledge repository, open sourced and shared for free, like a knowledge network built on the principles of free exchange and including diversity by incorporating ideas from different communities. Now every community is different. The, the values and the needs of the people involved differ. But the ideas from one project can always be applied to other communities, to other projects. And that's the value of diversity. Ideas from different sources and perspectives brought together to produce an optimal solution. So just to wrap up, I'd like to just leave you with one last idea. And that is that energy can be compared to water. So with water, you have tap water, which is free or almost free. Or you can have bottled water, always available when you want it. 
You can install a water filter at your home for pure water without any of those unwanted chemicals, like a guaranteed level of quality. Well, likewise for energy. Free energy can be made available to those who really need it. But for people who want a guaranteed level of quality and availability, they can pay for it. Free energy is already technically possible. The opportunity that we have is to use that to help those who need it most. Thank you.